had to do time down there, then had to do time up here, so he started a round table up here yeah. in the penal institution about halfway between yeah. uh, Fredericksburg and uh, between Hagerstown and Sharpsburg on the old uh, Hagerstown Turnpike. Yeah, I had a chance to hear you over at Gettysburg last year. I'm a, I'm a lifetime member of the Gettysburg Round Table. Yeah. <laughs> Now you are... Yeah, the Hagerstown Round Table started during the Civil War Centennial. Did it? So that would have been 50 years ago. And there was a guy named Rube Darby started. Rube, is, Rube disappeared mysteriously about 40 years ago. Hmm. Interesting. So you are Chief Historian Emeritus or just Historian Emeritus? No, I'm uh, Chief Historian Emeritus. Uh, they gave me that title when I retired. I retired from the Park Service on the uh, last day of uh, September 1995. Uh, uh, doesn't seem like it's 15, almost 50, it was 15 <laughs> years ago, about five months ago. And where were you educated? Where? Well, I uh, was uh, got my uh, bachelor's degree uh, from uh, Georgetown School of Foreign Service in Washington in 1949, and got an MA in history from Indiana University in 1955. Never went for a doctorate. You never went for a doctorate? Well, I have uh, two honorary doctorates. I was working on one, but I found it was more uh, a... I found out I was actually doing better with the Park Service than I would be doing with the, uh, in academia. Now, what do you do? Well, I... Uh, on the road, speaking about uh, the Civil War, American history, speaking about all our wars we've been in from the French and Indian War through WW2. Mm -hmm. So I am probably on the road, I probably on the road speaking at least 275 days a year. Wow. And how old are you, sir? I will be 88 on June 26th. 20 of uh, uh, this year. So that makes me being born in 1923. The ideal, uh, ideal year to be born because you get to participate throughout World War II. Mm -hmm. And an ideal age when you're single and young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what, uh, I'll start with some questions more about you and your background first before I get into this. What drew you to the Civil War? I grew up in Montana uh, and uh, I grew up and I was not particularly interested in it at the time. I grew up about, uh, as I like to say, a horseback, a short horseback ride from the Little Battle of the Little Bighorn. I knew, mm -hmm. I've gotten very interested in the Battle of Little Bighorn uh, uh, probably in the 1970s, but as growing up, I only visited the battlefield of the Little Bighorn twice uh, before I went in the Marine Corps. So I, uh, but I got interested in the Civil War, particularly uh, my father was a World War I Marine uh, and liked to read out loud to my brother and I. We lived on an isolated ranch uh, two and a half miles from the nearest neighbor in one direction and a lot further if you went out in other directions. And he liked to read out loud and uh, when I was in the uh, fifth, uh, when I was in the uh, seventh grade he happened to read a book on uh, James Jewel Brown Stewart, Jeb Stewart uh, by John Thomason and it captured me. So I've been interested in the Civil War since uh, uh, 19, uh, the winter, the, uh, the uh, winter of 19, uh, of 56, uh, 1946-47. Was that uh, Excuse me, 35, uh, 30, 
30, uh, 35, 36. Was, I'm not the round table. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I listen in? No. Or? Uh, as long as Mr. I, as long as Mr. Uh, I know, Dennis. Do you mind if I listen or? Uh, uh, I, do you mind if I listen in or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Are you okay if he listens? No, I, I, he, okay. he can listen. <laughs> Great. I know him well. <laughs> Great. So is is that the book by the young gentleman that rode with Stuart and then? No, no uh, the John book? Thomason was a Marine in World okay. War One. Most of his books were on the Marine Corps in World War One. So my father liked to read uh, Thomason's books, and I take it. In fact. Uh, Thomason only wrote uh, one uh, uh, Civil War, uh, primarily uh, uh, Civil War biography. He wrote several Civil War novels, but he did not write anything else about the Civil War. And was it the Civil War that drew you to the Marine Corps? Well, uh, I was interested in the Civil War before I went into the Marine Corps. Okay. When did you know that this would become your life? Well, I knew it. I was interested in the Civil War, both in uh, what would you call high school. I was interested in it uh, when I was uh, reading about it. I was interested in it in college, interested in the Marine Corps, uh, but became uh, found out in 1940, uh, 1954, uh, uh, I was when I had gotten my uh, uh, master's degree from Indiana on Pat Claiborne. He's a, uh, a rather exceptional uh, young man, that rose to the rank of a, a, brigadier, a major general of the Confederate Army. Uh, probably may have gone higher, but he uh, made a uh, proposal that didn't really sell well. Uh, came out and uh, made it in a memorandum, which he uh, presented before a, a number of Confederate officers on the second day of uh, January 1860. Uh, for Dalton, Georgia. Uh, it was that the Confederacy was running out of manpower. And he urged them to have a, that tap into a manpower, a source of manpower that they were using only uh, to support their economy. In other words, he suggested uh, recruiting blacks into the Confederate Army, which uh, was suppressed his proposal, and he goes no higher. So uh, I did a, uh, I did a, my uh, master's thesis on him, and I decided after doing the master's thesis, it might be important if I visited the sites where he fought, mm -hmm. uh, because you learn some, one thing, you learn in the military, particularly if you're a grunt. That is being in the infantry, you learn pretty well if you're going to live or die. And the ground cover depends on it. That sounds a strange way, but uh, I uh, visited the Shiloh National Military Park mm -hmm. uh, where I ran into a exceptional young man, uh, Pete Shen. And I told him I was interested in finding out where uh, Claiborne's brigade fought at the Battle of Shiloh. Mm -hmm. And we went out uh, the next day, he said, come back, and we went out and we walked the battlefield. And uh, he was in the National Park Service. And uh, I, then we got to discussing. Now, we got to discussing indirectly what I'm going to be talking about tonight, the Battle of Shiloh. Now, one, uh, up to 2.30 in the afternoon on the uh, sixth day of April, the Confederates 
are apparently winning the battle of Shiloh. And General Albert Sidney Johnston will lead a charge in which they'll break the Union position at uh, Sarah Bell's Peach Orchard and he will be mortally wounded. Now, if you're a good Confederate, uh, you, in your reunions thereafter, you will discuss that if he had not been mortally wounded and, not had, died, and had not died, you would have won the battle. Because at the time, uh, the Confederates have broken through a Union position. And, uh, and with the, they pause uh, while they uh, bring, uh, notify another fellow that he's now commanding the Confederate Army, uh, Albert's uh, General B.G. to a Beauregard. And the Confederates cease attacking temporarily. And the theory would be, if Johnson had not been killed, mortally wounded, there would not have been this suspension in the attack. And the Confederates would have swept forward and crossed Dill Branch and forced the Union Army to surrender. Unfortunately for the Confederates, they don't do that. And uh, they always and so uh, Pete Shedd said, why don't we take a walk and see if you'll agree with me. So we walked the ground that the Confederates would have to advance over. It was generally level, but after it came out of Cloud Field, it came into a ravine that ran uh, perpendicular to the line of advance. The ravine is quite deep. Uh, waters were backed into it, and gunboats were at the mouth of it firing up the ravine. And after walking that ground and seeing the situation, I thought the Confederates were daydreaming hmm. if they thought they could have pressed on and won the battle that day. Then I started discussing uh, with Pete Shutt, what do you do? He says, I'm the park historian here at Shiloh National Military Park. And I said, I said what do you do? I said, I interpret the battle. I may have a school group out interpreting the battle to them. And I may have a person like you that's generally interested in the detail of the battle. So, uh, I, uh, that, he said, that's one of my primary duties is interpreting the Battle of Shiloh, what happened there, the people involved. And I said, uh, are you paid for it? <laughs> said, yes. It's a career, it's a, a civil service job. And uh, then he said, well, uh, have you ever worked for the government? And I said, yes, both in the Marine Corps and with the Department of Defense. Well, he says, you've got civil service status. So he said, uh, since you're interested, you know a great deal about the subject we're talking about, uh, and you're interested in a career, why don't you uh, contact the National Park Service and see if they have an opening? I thought this is a guy doing what I'm traveling around the country uh, to uh, fork out my money to go see the sites. And he is doing his, his, voca uh, his vocation is an avocation. Maybe I can make it my vocation. So I didn't follow up on it for about uh, nine months. And uh, at this time, I was working for the Office of Chief of Military History in Washington. And my mother <coughs> and a great aunt 
the great aunt was related to me, but not my mother, because she's related to me on my father's side. So I'm driving them down to Williamsburg, and we stop at George Washington birthplace. <coughs> a national monument. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. 